Greetings, welcome back to Black Bear News, where we are discussing climate change, abrupt climate change, things adjacent. And if you're tuning in, you're probably smarter than the average bear. Well, so where to begin? Uh, where do we leave off? I don't know. There's so much, so much a happening. Um, again, I can't begin to cover it all. Uh, so yeah, I actually want to just start off with. Uh, so let me just make the statement that I think YouTube is absolutely smashing my channel, and they have been for the last few weeks. So if you are find yourself unsubscribed, please check if you're subscribed and resubscribe to the channel. And uh, just like it's a really strange thing because a lot of my like overall numbers seem to be they, what they seem to be doing is like squashing the views on a video for the first day or two. And then, you know, three or four days later, I'll have a whole ton of views on that very video. But, um, what I'm used to getting in one day seems to be decreasing all the time. I don't know. Or maybe, maybe it's just me. Maybe I just, you know, I don't know. I, I don't look, maybe I don't look so good anymore. I don't know. Maybe I'm just like, can't speak anymore. Maybe, Maybe it's my fault. I don't know. Anyways, uh, but you know, like if you can, subscri subscribe if you're unsubscribed, etc. So uh, yesterday in the live video, I think some people took umbrage with me um, kind of cheering on the fact that Trump is pulling out of Syria. Um, honestly, I'm, a I'm conflicted about him pulling out of Syria. I, you know, now that I've just had a day, I didn't... I didn't actually know that that had happened. Um, somebody said something about it. Um, or I just found out about it right before the video or something like that. And uh, so I didn't really know all the details about it. It's one of those things that is a very difficult subject because it's like when Obama pulled out of Iraq. Uh, I mean, kind of, if you see what happened, if you look at what happened, there became... there. It created a huge power vacuum. Um, uh, some people say that I, you know ISIS was formed out of kind of the the vacuum that existed in Iraq um, or in regions, you know, on the edge of Iraq. And and now in there's still unrest going on now. So now people are still unhappy. There's just there's still mayhem going on. And I don't know that you can really. Uh, pin that on the U S pulling out. I think you could pin that on the U S going in and the same, and the same thing's happening in Syria because, you know, to leave is to leave this utter mess behind and leave, you know, all these little factions fighting it out. And, and I don't know if, I don't know if Trump's reasons for, for pulling out are, are great. Um, but he has, the fact is he has been trying to pull out ever since he took office and I, and for what it is, I know that, you know, it's just the, the general mainstream media liberal mindset is that we just want to, we want to find fault in everything that Trump does and nothing he does is for a good reason. And everything he does is a, is a bumbling mess. And pretty much that's true. I'm just saying he, you know, he can be right about some things, not, not, uh, not joining, opting out of the TPP was an exceptional move. And, you know, for whatever reasons he did it, I, you know, I'm so glad that we didn't do it because the TPP was literally NAFTA on steroids and would have given corporations huge amounts of power and literally taken away power from individual sovereign nations and given it over to multinational corporations. That is a bad thing altogether. And for whatever reason, Trump didn't want to do it. Maybe he saw those reasons as, you know, being what they were. He didn't do it. And I'm going to give it, I'm going to give him just like a little bit of the benefit of the doubt that, you know, his, his instincts on trying to pull out of wars, regime change wars or endless wars is the right instinct, not necessarily saying that he did it the right way, not saying he went about it in the, in the correct manner, not saying that, you know, the people that are left behind are in any better shape or have any kind of assurances of being okay. I don't know that they do. 
Um, but for whatever, you know, I don't know. The thing is, is that, you know, the, the, the so-called grownups who, you know, should be in charge of the company, uh, of the company, the country are totally fine with, you know, <clears throat> overthrowing Libya or getting into a war in Syria or, or getting into a war in Yemen or staying in a war in Afghanistan for 18 years. They're totally fine with that. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know about the grownups either. Anyways, I just want to, you know, I want to just touch on that. And, you know, it's, it is the dilemma of, so, you know, I was having a little co- discussion with um, Jay Thadcast in the um, comment section. And he brought up the Doomer dilemma of, you know, if you try to solve climate change, you probably end up exacerbating some of the problems that we're already facing, right? You, you probably end up possibly raising the temperature by lowering emissions or, you know, uh, if you take down the grid, uh, the nuclear power plants go, go down, right? And then that's sudden, sudden and utter catastrophe for everyone. If you, um, if the economic system tanks or if the industrial, industrial civilization kind of falls apart, willy nilly guess what lots of people die um so it's really it's hard to know what to do in these times because you want to do the right thing and it seems like the right thing is the wrong thing um and many people are cheering on doing the wrong thing because somehow that like that's you know what everybody knows or that's the status quo or everybody can be comfortable doing the wrong thing so why rock the boat i don't know um, it's hard to even moralize on any level about any of this. I can only say that I think doing the right thing is doing the right thing. Even if the, even if the consequences are not so great, um, you kind of have to go forward and do the right thing and then try and figure out how to do the better thing as you're going along. Um, that's kind of just how life works in general, right? You don't really know. It's like making a decision about your life. You really don't know what's going to happen you just kind of just go forward. You, you, you use your logic or your common sense to make the right decision. And sometimes those right decisions turned out to be total disasters. So, you know, do the right thing anyways. Do the right thing because it's the right thing. Um, I still think that getting out of wars is the right thing to do. I, think, I still think that bringing our troops home is the right thing to do. And I've, I, I've, I've spoken with people about this publicly and privately, right, about the idea of bringing all the troops home in order to possibly fight climate change or in order to just stop, you know, put an end to U.S. imperialism or maybe put an end to the United States military burning more fossil fuels than anybody else in, on the planet. Um, you know, and people are like, how dare you even think such an idea? I mean, you can't do that because, you know, all the crazy people out there are just going to come and bomb you and, you know, storm you. And I just, I just don't. I'm just not there. I'm just not there. It's just me. Maybe I have a huge blind spot in my, in my thinking or in my, uh, logic. I don't know. Um, I just think doing the right thing is doing the right thing at the end of the day. Um, and you want to mitigate, you want to mitigate damage or harm in doing the right thing. You don't want to just do the right thing and just, you know, not care if anybody gets smashed while you're doing it. But, you know, uh, honestly, if we have any chance of saving the planet, you know, we're going to have to, you know, there's, there's casualties if we don't save the planet and there's casualties if we do save the planet. And so, um, you kind of have to just go with the, the, the best choice on that one, which is saving the planet and, you know, and say a prayer and, and a, and a huge apology for the casualties that happen in saving the planet. Um, You know, just like the Extinction Rebellion video, uh, where there's, you know, we're sorry that we're protesting. We're sorry that we're disrupting your lives. We'd rather not disrupt your lives. But this needs to be done, you know? Um, So apologies if, you know, me cheering on the right thing ruffles some feathers. I'm going to continue cheering on the right thing, whatever that might be. Uh, So let's go into some cl- climate change things. 
<clears throat> it was a long old rant. And uh, so, the, you know, so many people sent so many people sent me this article. And this is rather huge and rather huge and frightening news. This is out of Newsweek. Sea boiling with methane discovered in Siberia. No one has ever recorded anything like this before. And this is from today. Scientists in Siberia have discovered an area of sea that is boiling with methane, with bubbles that can be scooped from the water with buckets. Researchers on an expedition to East Siberian Sea, the East Siberian Sea, said the methane fountain was unlike anything they had seen before. With concentrations of the gas in the region to be six to seven times higher than the global average. Concentrations of the gas in the region to be six to seven times higher than the global average. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's not six or seven percent. That's six or seven hundred percent. Uh, or five or six hundred percent, whatever it is. You know what I'm saying. All you math people. The, this team, led by Igor Similitov from the Tomsk Polytechnic Us University in Russia, traveled to an area of the eastern Arctic previously known to produce methane fountains. They were studying the environmental consequences of permafrost thawing beneath the ocean. Permafrost is ground that is permanently frozen, in case you didn't know that. In some cases, for tens of thousands of years, according to the National Snow and Ice Data Center, permafrost currently covers about 8.7 million square miles of the northern hemisphere. Locked within in the permafrost is organic material. When the ground thaws, this material starts to break down, and as it does, it releases methane. A greenhouse gas far more potent than carbon dioxide with global temperatures increasing, scientists are concerned. The warming will result in more permafrost thawing, uh, causing more methane to be released, leading to even more warming, known as a positive feedback loop. A huge proportion of Siberia is covered in permafrost, but this is sta starting to change. Over recent years, scientists working in remote regions have started to uh, documenting changes to the landscape thought to be related to it thawing, including huge craters. Uh, if you all remember the um, <clears throat> on the Yam Yamul, uh, Yamal Peninsula, there were this huge, huge, gigantic like blowholes of, and you know, most scientists kind of pinned it on explosions of methane. Um, Permafrost is also present under the ocean. 2017, scientists announced they had discovered hundreds of craters at the bottom of the Barents Sea, north of Norway and Russia. The craters had formed from methane building up, then exploding suddenly when the pressure got too high. In the latest expedition to chart methane emissions coming from the ocean, researchers analyzed the water around Bennett Island, taking samples of seawater and sediments. In one area, however, they found something unexpected, an extremely sharp increase in the concentration of atmospheric methane. According to a statement from Tomsk Polytechnic University, it was six to seven times higher than average. Then they noticed an, an area of water around four to five square meters that was boiling with methane bubbles. The statement said this could be scooped out with buckets. The researcher said after identifying the fountain, the team was able to take samples directly from it. Methane levels around the fountain were nine times higher than average Nine times higher than gl average global concentrations. This is the most powerful gas fountain ever seen. So Militov said, according to translation from Mo Moscow Times, no one has ever recorded anything like this before. Uh, not, not good news or non-good, as Jennifer Hines puts it. Uh, this is not good. This is... Um, you know, maybe not the methane bomb, but a methane bomb. And pro and probably doesn't mean good things for the future of the warming of the planet. Um, since it takes, you know, a little bit of time for the methane to disperse through the atmosphere. But that's obviously going to raise atmospheric concentrations globally. Thus raising heating globally. Um, not a good thing. So anyways, I'm going to wrap it up for this video. So tomorrow I'm going to be talking to Torstein. 
Uh, I guess we're going to do, I don't know if we're going to do a live thing or not. I'm not sure yet. We haven't really pinned it down, but uh, 2 p.m. my time tomorrow. Um, if we're going live, if you want, want to tune in then, uh, 2 p.m. Pacific daylight time. Uh, I'll be talking with Torstein from Going South. Uh, so you guys can tune into that tomorrow, and um, we will probably be talking a little bit about the Arctic sea ice uh, <clears throat> data that was just recently released. Looks like the second lowest behind 2012, which is holds the record for the lowest um, extent, I guess, or you know, the lowest sea ice measured. So that, you know, that's not necessarily a great thing either. Um, we didn't surpass 2012, but we are right up behind it, it looks like. <clears throat> so, yeah, um, I will see you tomorrow. Thank you so much for your eyes, your ears, and your conscience. If you would like to support this channel, you can do so at the links below. Until next time, peace. Thank you.